First up is Transformers Rise of the Beasts. And while I've seen every film that has come out in theaters since 2007, I have to acknowledge that growing up, Transformers was not exactly a huge part of my life. You know, I didn't get into the cartoons. I didn't really get into the toys. They were around, but it just wasn't for me. The exception to this was the Maximals, because Every once in a while, I wasn't really allowed to watch TV growing up, which is ironic now, but I would be able to sneak a little bit of Beast Wars. And I remember at the time being super impressed because it was a fully CG show, but it was on television and all these things. If you look back at it now, it's like, wow, that was so rudimentary. But let's remember at the time, it wasn't a thing that you really saw on television or even in theaters, right? You know, we didn't have animated CG movies coming out, you know, pumping out constantly. But anyway, so... I don't bring that sort of childhood or nostalgic affection to a lot of these characters, except for the Maximals. So that probably aggressively informs uh, some of this film for me. But the other thing I have to say about Rise of the Beasts is that I think the first film in Transformers was very fun. Uh, you know, we weren't expecting that. It was this sort of blockbuster resurgence. And then from there, they've either gotten more absurd or harder to follow or whatever it was. And then we got Bumblebee, which is the last one prior to this. And I thought Bumblebee was really a great film, you know. It, it broke with the formula that we've been seeing, which I think was a smart move on their part. Uh, I, I've, I always describe it as it's basically how to train your dragon, but with a car, you know. But I think there was a lot of heart to it, and it helped to focus on just one character. And, you know, I just think it was a very refreshing entry. But Transformers Rise of the Beast goes back to the sort of same formula that we've been following for the last few ones, and particularly, you know, things like The Last night and age of extinction you know it's very plug and play which for some people is what they're looking for and i don't begrudge anybody who's going to enjoy it because of that experience but if you are coming in off of bumblebee and you like bumblebee but you didn't really care for the other ones this is not going to be for you the other thing I have about this movie, so I will uh, admit to something I'm not proud of, but there was an absolutely chaotic parking disaster happening for the screening I was supposed to go to. So I missed the first uh, almost 15, 20 minutes of this film, and yet it still felt too long for me. Uh, you know, again, having seen the other Transformers films, I talked to my friend who was with me and I was like, let me guess what I missed. And I was spot on. So that is a little disconcerting. I was able to jump in 20 minutes in without having any, you know, it was fine because it's so formulaic and it follows every other film like this. But... You know, I digress. Like I said, that is what you might be looking for with this. This one stars Anthony Ramos, Dominique Fishback, and then you've got the addition of, in addition to our, you know, traditional voice cast of Transformers, the Maximals, who are, yeah, they're not car Transformers, they're creature Transformers. You've got Ron Perlman as Optimus Primal. You've got the great Michelle Yeoh as Air Razor. And then in terms of the car ones, you've got Pete Davidson as Mirage. The Mirage thing goes back to my point about not being super familiar with things in the franchise outside of the movies. People seem super stoked about Mirage being there. I was lacking that base level of excitement for his appearance because, again, I didn't know who the character was or what he does, and uh, I, I made it to the theater in time for the introduction of the character, so it's not like I missed that part of it, but people were like, ooh, yay. I was like, you are counting on people's advanced knowledge of this instead of creating a character that we should be excited to see anyway. You know, these films are basically playing off of you having a foundation in this franchise, which you know, it can be kind of frustrating because they simultaneously rely on you having a foundation of it, but they always seem insistent upon, you know, reintroducing everything over and over and over again. They're sequels that always act like you haven't seen the other one and so they do a ton. All these movies are, there's so much exposition in this film. It's like, we're going to we're gonna tell you the thing we're about to do, then we're going to show you the thing we're going to do, and then we're going to talk over the thing we're going to do, even though we've already gone over it with you three times. Anyway, I thought this movie was too long. I, you know, I, the action is fine. It's whatever. It's the same thing we've seen in every single Transformers movie. Anthony Ramos is what is whatever. I get people are excited for the representation factor, and that's great. That's the one good thing about this film, I think. But aside from that, I, I think the main takeaway is if you were already a fan of Transformers, you're going to go see this movie anyway, and you're probably going to have a decent time. If you were not a fan of Transformers, this is not going to be your entry point into it, even though, I, I, as I said, these all give you so much exposition that you could, in theory, pick up at any single point. Yeah, I, you know, if you had to pick one to watch, I would say watch Bumblebee, not this. But 
if you are gonna have a great time at this movie, I, I wish you well. But because I felt it was long and repetitive and formulaic, it didn't exactly bring anything new to this franchise. And especially, again, building off of Bumblebee, which did actually do that, I'm gonna give this a 2.6 out of 5. The other thing I have this week is season four of Never Have I Ever, and I just have to give a shout out to Mindy Kaling for making these shows that present girls, and especially like teenage and college age girls, in a three-dimensional way and show that they have wants and needs and desires and, you know, have complex friendships and are just, you know, fully formed humans. That is something that I don't think we get enough of in media. However, I do have to note that by the time that we got to, or get to, the fourth season of it, it pushes into such a fantastical realm for me, and, and not to say like, you know, dragons and goblins fantasy, but just, you know, some of it feels a little less grounded than the first and second seasons did. And I had the same kind of challenge with the third season of Never Have I Ever, but I'm happy to see this character progress. But the there are, uh, there's a lot of unevenness to the fourth season where, you know, she's made progress and developed and then she like undoes it all. And then she you know, shows signs of maturity and then undoes it all. And yes, that is close to reality, but I think, you know, it, it the later seasons have trouble finding that balance between escapism and also like semi-accurate representation. But I was just happy to see it close out. I think it's time to close the books on the character and Davy. And I think they were smart to like have it mirror, you know, high school and that we've had four years and then we are wrapping it up. There are, like I said, some things I don't necessarily agree with, but I also have to acknowledge it is a f fictional show. I think it's a compliment to the show to show how invested I was in this character and therefore was invested in this fictional character's decision-making skills. But, you know, at the end of the day, I think it's still a fun ride. If you enjoyed the first season, you'll still enjoy the fourth season. Obviously, you're not going to start with the fourth season, but there's no reason not to finish out the show. So just a heads up that season four of Never Have I Ever is out now on Netflix. The last thing I have this week is Jury Duty, and I'm so late to the game on this. So it has been out for a while, but I finally got around to watching it. And this is how much I liked it, is that I'm including it super late. The premise of the show is a court case is taking place, and there's a documentary, I put that in quotes, you can't see the quotes, but air quotes, of the experience of serving on a jury. And the catch is that everybody is in on the fact that it is not a real court, everyone is an actor, etc., etc., except for one guy. And it feels reminiscent of early iterations of reality shows, except for those ones, it felt like they were kind of making fun of the person who wasn't in on it. In this one, I feel like, and I could be wrong and I hope I'm not, but I feel like they were very considerate of trying not to make him the butt of the joke. And they lucked out in terms of finding their, quote, hero. It's this guy named Rod, and I really hope that this experience does not go to his head and does not corrupt him. And, you know, he, he continues to be a good guy. Um, he's not like a paragon of goodness, but he just seems like like a wholesome, chummy dude that you want to grab a beer with, uh, to quote certain political things. But uh, yeah, it, it was fascinating. And I was so impressed with how they pulled it off because it's not like you get to have multiple takes during these things, right? They're all actors, but they all have to improvise so well and they have to stay ahead of his, you know, game. And uh, yeah, it was just, it's, it's super quick. It's on Amazon Prime. The, if they had found a less compelling hero, protagonist, whatever, I would have been more disappointed. But uh, the other catch to it is... Uh, James Marsden, the actor, uh, plays himself effectively, which adds just a level of ridiculousness to it. You know, as someone who watches a lot of things, I actually recognize some of the actors in the background. So I was like, oh, how did you, has he never seen like Parks and Rec? But, you know, I, I, they found the right person for this. But yeah, Jury Duty, it was just, it's fun and ridiculous. And the things they keep throwing at this dude are so wild. And yet he handles it with such grace that it makes it a palatable experience. It could have been so cringe, but it ends up just being this really funny, ridiculous experiment. I have to, jury duty on Amazon Prime. It was, it was great. 